We're bringing to you the scientific principles of sports rehabilitation. Episode number one. So what this means is we're going to make all the mistakes in the world. The sound quality is going to be god awful. Um, and you're probably not going to want to listen to another one. But every episode is going to get a little bit better. Not the actual content. It's probably going to be the same boring shit. But the product quality and the, the production will be much better. So we apologize in advance for anything. Um, the, any feedback that you guys can give us on, on logistics and, and that, you know, IT difficulties, all that stuff, we will take into account. Uh, but, but welcome. We, I think Derek and, and Michael, we officially have zero listeners, so we're, we're nailing it right now. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's only up from here. <laughs> it's only up from here. And we'll, so we're all, the way we're going to do this thing is we're all going to introduce ourselves here in a second. Um, I'm just going to give a little intro about, about clinical athlete as a whole, uh, as a network of, of healthcare providers who hopefully have a, a yearning for the evidence-based practice of uh, athletes and, and looking to improve their athletes' outcomes using scientific principles. And that's what this uh, podcast is going, to be all be, is going to be all about. We have some upcoming events that I just want to really quick name off here. We've got a two-day uh, weightlifting certification in Melbourne, Florida in June, Bremerton, Washington in July, Dallas, Texas in September, Brooklyn, New York in September, or Sherwood, Oregon in November, and La Crosse, Wisconsin in November. Details for those events can be clinicalathlete.com slash events. And then our newest course in which Derek Miles and Michael Ray will be teaching the scientific principles of sports rehabilitation, the actual course, will be in Worcester, Massachusetts in July, Harrisonburg, Virginia in July, Hillsboro, Oregon, uh, August, August 19th, Ottawa, Ontario for you Canadians in September, Falls Church, Virginia in September, Richmond, Virginia in September, Harwood Heights, Illinois, which is a suburb of the Shy in September as well. So clinicalathlete.com slash events for all of those uh, courses. The scientific principles of sports rehab will be accredited for CEUs, for physical therapists, chiros, and athletic trainers. And uh, we actually got the two-day weightlifting course approved for PTs down in Florida. I thought that was pretty cool. Now, on to introing ourselves. Michael Ray, who are you? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I'm a chiropractor in... Oh, what? Well, you're Virginia. a Cairo. Get the, get the fuck off this. I know, right? I, I can't believe they allow me on a podcast with two physical therapists. Oh, man. Uh, Poor guy. I don't really know what the world's coming to these days. All right, go but, on. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I own a practice called Shenandoah Valley Performance Clinic here locally, and then I own a CrossFit gym as well called CrossFit Callisto. So, yeah, so I'm um, enjoying have... working. Yeah, so you're a clinician. You have, you're a clinician who has your office within a gym. Correct. Yeah, the the CrossFit box or gym, so to speak, doubles as my active rehab room. That's awesome. Yeah. So you get all the equipment you need. Exactly. What about what about all of your fancy uh, bells and whistles and and modalities and uh, vibrators and? Well, we're talking about home or clinic. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, man, I don't have a whole lot. Like, if you walk through my clinic slash gym. It's what you'd see in a gym, barbells, kettlebells, uh, bumper plates, boxes, nothing fancy, man. Love it. Derek Miles, who are you? I am a physical therapist at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida for the time being, currently in the job market heading to the West Coast. Um, I do sports medicine for the university, also with the regular population here in the town of Gainesville, um, see everything from weightlifters to runners on a regular basis. That's awesome. And, and, and my name is Quinn Hennick, and uh, I have a small clinic in Southern California, in Orange County, California, very similar setup to Michael. So small office, just the bare essentials. I have a table and I have a desk, uh, and I got, a, I got a couple kettlebells in here, and then I've got a huge gym outside, that I, all the equipment that I could ever need, and, and that, that truly just kind of encompasses um, I, I guess, you know, maybe our philosophies as clinical athlete as a whole is just, you know, the bare essentials, um, the basics and, and, you know, the, the cold hard truths about 
about re uh, rehab, you know, physical rehab. And uh, I met these two guys through Clinical Athlete, which is a directory or just a network of healthcare providers, like I said, who hopefully have a better understanding of these things or at least are, are looking for the truths in regards to sports rehabilitation. And so we actually have a directory of these clinicians on clinicalathlete.com. We have a private forum uh, in which we're having these discussions on a daily basis. And honestly, these two guys have been instrumental in that forum. And, and I can't thank you guys enough for your contributions. I mean, really uh, have made that thing extremely valuable. And I've learned a ton. And then you guys uh, flip a coin here, but talk about the Logic of Rehab blog that both of you started. Interesting. I think it started out of just our desire to kind of take on some uh, popular topics in physical medicine and rehab and try to decide, like, how do we make sense of evidence and apply that to clinical practice? And ultimately, <laughs> what we try to avoid is a lot of just us ranting about um, inaccurate uh, modalities or inefficacious modalities in their use in clinical practice. So we'll, we'll save the ranting for uh, the podcast, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's the idea. Derek, what do you what do you it, have to say about the logic of rehab? Why are you doing that? I think it started out as because Mike pushes me to go right on occasion. Um, I think it really started out as a drive towards analyzing the BS within the profession. Uh, in profession, I mean rehab as a whole. Uh, you know, it's uh, we'll in this podcast most likely discuss about some of the silos that come out where we like to call out other professions. But ultimately, if we're in it for the patient, we're all in it together. And we have to be able to discern at what point we're going to say some treatment or whatever has value. And this is basically the process that we should be learning as clinicians. And Mike and I wanted to flesh out that process and look at the evidence that we could apply to help us make those decisions. So it's, it's scientific ranting. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and as a, we, we try to get across like, you know, what's the take home message of this information, but often it tends to scientific well, ranting. I mean, you know, I, I like it because you, you pick you you pick specific topics that are that are common in the industry and you know you have a narrative there, but you you're I mean that's what that's what science is. It, you know, it, the evidence um, helps us helps guide, you know, hopefully our narrative is as, as unbiased as possible, as impossible as that is. Um, but you know what I what I like about the logic of rehab blog is that you you take these these studies about specific modalities or ideologies, and um, you kind of just condense it down and, and make it a little bit more digestible. And I think, with probably something that we're going to talk about in this episode, just the the mass amount of information out there, and not just in the internet blog world, but just, you know, the amount of papers and and reviews that are published. It's just damn near impossible to stay up on all that stuff. And so, any time that you know, active clinicians can put together information like that in a digestible format um, with references, you know, I, I think it's extremely valuable. So um, all zero listeners, maybe we have one listener when this thing comes out, uh, definitely go check out the logic of rehab. Um, uh, it's just amazing content there. And that kind of segues into our topic of, of today, which I don't think we ever even uh, decided on a title, but, you know, how do we know what we know, I, I think, maybe um, is, a, is a good starting point to jump off from. And we've got three papers that we're probably going to dive into here, one of which is something, is a paper that probably uh, many of our listeners are familiar with being referenced as far as the definition or how, how evidence-based medicine is often defined, which is evidence-based medicine, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, it's about integrating individual clinical expertise and the best external evidence. And that's, uh, David Sackett and, and his colleagues way back in 96. And this is the, the famous Sackett article that you hear referenced, uh, so often the second article of which kind of ducktails off of that, which is evidence-based medicine has been hijacked a report to David Sackett. And that's by John Ioannidis. And that's uh, from 2016. So we're looking at, you know, the last 20 years, uh, how this thing has evolved. And then finally, article number three, the most recent, the title is Progress in Evidence-Based Medicine, a Quarter Century On. And did you guys figure out how to pronounce the lead author's first last name? Jules. Jules. Yeah. 
Joel yeah. Bigovich. There's a G there. Is, it, Bigov- is the D, is Bigovich. the D silent? I'm guessing the D know. silent. Uh, Benjamin, we apologize. Joel Bigovich <laughs> and uh, Gordon Ga- Gordon Guyett, who is actually a pretty darn well known name in the whole realm of evidence based medicine. He seems to be one of the forefathers of of the term itself. So those two authors on that third paper. Uh, and I say, kind of let's just jump right in here. You know, I've read the Sackett article or commentary uh, several times. And every time, you know, it's well written. I, I, I like reading it. Uh, but every time I read it, I'm just amazed that the, this two-page commentary had, is something that people cite as um, like the definition. You know, and it, yeah. and and we're going to talk about how his the way that he's uh, portraying evidence based medicine has been misinterpreted um, and kind of you know misrepresented. But it's just amazing to me how far this this little commentary article has been taken. You know, and and as just fact. Oh, the second article. You know, uh, three three pronged approach to evidence based medicine. Sackett said it himself. And then when you read the article, it's just his, it's just two pages of his thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's really just, it's really just incredible. And I, I guess that's kind of where I want to start is what is, what is David Sackett's, you know, initial message here in this article from, from 1996? It would seem there's definitely a concession that he wanted to move away from experience-based medicine, which was how a lot of medicine evolved over the years, and advocate for being able to justify how we do what we do or how we diagnose or how we treat and being able to justify that with some type of evidence beyond it worked for me. The problem is it got bastardized into a a epistemological out for people to be able to just concede, well, Sackett said that expertise matters and I have that, or Sackett says patient value matter, or patient values matter, so I have that. But the problem is we need to still be able to qualify what constitutes expertise, and that goes back to the evidence. And then we need to ask who sets the patient values, and that still goes back to what's being marketed instead of coming from a knowledge base. Yeah, I think um, something that you were mentioning, Quinn, and, and like you, Derek, with bastardizing, what Sackett actually meant is we often hear experience in place of expertise. And I would argue those are two different things. Experience is kind of like what we see on a daily basis, um, what's right in front of us, and what we think is, is all there is in front of us is all that exists. And I think what Sackett was trying to argue with expertise was that realizing this is what the research is currently showing and then knowing how does that research apply to the patient in front of us. And that's what expertise is, is the application of the current best evidence. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that what we see as the common interpretation of, of his article is that the three, you know, these three entities or this, these three ideas of, of external, you know, best external evidence, um, clinical expertise, and patient values are equal. They have equal weight. Um, they, you know, it's a three, it's a three pronged approach. And that he didn't say that once in his article. That it's not even uh, he doesn't even I mean reference that at all. You know, it, it's not even hinting towards that. He mentions them as components, and then you know, it's it's my interpretation that the evidence um, guides the expertise, the expertise being the skill uh, at at implementing the evidence, the skill of implementing and respecting and uh, observing patient values and patient preferences, the skill of listening to the patient, listening to the patient and giving them exactly what they want are not the same thing. You know, Taking into account patient values and preferences, acknowledging the patient's value does not mean that you do what the patient wants every time that they that they uh, prefer you know a, a certain treatment. That's where the evidence comes in. Now, t- to me, it's up to the clinician, clinician's expertise to be skilled enough to uh, make the evidence you know implement it themselves and in, in practice, but also make it digestible for the patient. 
to to create that buy-in and to change expectations. But I, I think I see the patient values being misinterpreted as, oh, that means that we should do what the patient wants, you know, or like, you know, we yeah. can we can spin our own narratives of the evidence as long as it as it ultimately it, it appeases the patient at, with their initial expectations. But it's our job to to modify those expectations to a large extent. Um, and then Derek, you mentioned, you know, experience, like you said, both of you guys said it actually clinical experience is, is not what he says. It's, it's clinical expertise is, is that uh, approach there. Experience is one way that you gain skills. You know, if expertise, clinical expertise is your clinical skill, you need time. Like, you know, the more, the more time you accrue and more, uh, ex different experiences that you have with different cases can build your your expertise. It can it can give you the knowledge of how to implement the evidence. But your experience itself is not it is not evidence. That's not the best available external evidence. And I and I feel like even though the interpretation is this three pronged approach, which is by itself misinterpreted. Then there's still more weight put on clinical experience, which is not even what he was saying. It's not even the experience; right. it's expertise. And then there's more, and then there's uh, more weight put on patient values than there is on current best evidence. So I think that I, I think that people tout a three pronged approach, and then that's not even how they implement it. And then the way that they implement it is skewed in a way uh, that, to me, needs to be almost inversed. Whereas each each individual case, you know, those those three uh, tiers are weighted different. What do you guys think yeah. about that? Am I full of shit here? No, I, I well, think that's that's is, debatable. Well, yeah, there's that, but um, yes. it really comes back to being able to justify why you're doing what you're doing. And expertise or experience could just be because that's the way I've always done it. And this goes back to you know some multiple layers of things with. If you come out and get indoctrinated into one school, then you only really have experience in that one school. But do you really develop expertise as a result of that? Or is it about gaining experiences from different schools of thought and being able to broad frame and look at things from a little bit wider angle lens? And some of it comes down to even being able to logically explain why you do what you do. And if you really get into formal logic, it is the scientific method. So it's being able to look at external evidence and say, this is bigger than me as a clinician. There have been multiple people look at this problem and I need to at least take into account their viewpoint on it or not even their viewpoint, but the data that they have produced either for or against my argument. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just also say too, because we're um, talking about this and experience is often utilized as validation as evidence. We probably should define what is evidence. Um, and what is uh, the differences in types of evidence and why they should bear different weights in clinical practice. Well, go for it, Mike. Mr. Smart <laughs> awesome. Get, give, give me the difficult uh, question. Um, I think I would pull from uh, Guyot, who actually wrote the third paper we'll probably talk about tonight. Um, and he defines evidence as any empirical observation about the apparent relationship between two events constitutes potential evidence keyword being potential there. Um, so I, I think we could say experience is evidence. It's just not weighted as much as other things that are controlled studies that are allocated as, you know, applicable evidence to clinical practice. I wouldn't want to hang my hat on just my own observation of something and making a ton of uh, fallacies and having biases that will skew that interpretation. I'd weighted weighted on something that's a controlled study. So I think ultimately evidence to get to the point of it is just to move us closer to truth. And we definitely can debate about what is truth, but for clinical practice, what's going to help the patient in the most efficacious way for long-term outcomes. Well, and I, yeah. And I think you're still, you know, your experience as a clinician is, is ultimately trial and error, trying to implement what you feel are, are the scientific principles. So, and so the interpretation of the evidence is difficult. You know, we can read it. We can read a paper and and interpret it in a way that that maybe um, if we're inexperienced interpreting science or evidence, or we don't have the totality of the evidence, we're just you know taking it off of this one paper, um, and then we try to implement it that way. In our minds, it's evidence-based medicine because we're going off of what the evidence that we read. But you know, 
the implementation is is uh, maybe not valid. And then that's how we can hone. But it's trial and error. You know, the more we learn uh, about appraising evidence, the more we learn about implementing the evidence, then uh, we gain more experience in that sense. Just it goes back to something that Derek said: the the fallacy of um, well, it worked. It worked for me. Working meaning. Um, it was effective at the patient telling me that they had less pain or that they had more range of motion or quote unquote, that feels better now that I did that exercise or, you know, after this manual therapy treatment and then using that as your scientific evidence um, and really just confirming, you know, patting yourself on the back and c confirming your bias now that every patient that walks in the door who presents in any type of similar fashion is now going to get that treatment because now it works for everybody. I think that's, that's when experience can work against us. Um, it's, it's very hard not to bias yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, but that's why I think having these discussions is so important. Questioning each other is so important because it keeps us on our toes. You know, I know, and Mike, you can probably attest to this working in pra practice by yourself. Sometimes it's hard not to kind of get stuck in your comfort zone, you know, and, yeah. and get, you know, confirming your own biases and like, these are my favorite exercises and this is what I think works for this and nobody's there to call you on your shit. Um, and it's just, it, it's very easy then to and not read the research, you know, yeah. cause things are going well and, um, you're, you're so confident in what you're doing. The patients feel confident in you and natural history takes its course, but they like you. And so it's attributed to your skills, right? And I think Derek, you've been in a, situation in your uh, environment, your work environment, where you have multiple clinicians and you, it, it, from my understanding, it sounds like you guys have no problem asking each other questions, you know, having discussions, calling each other on some, on BS every now and then. Uh, can you talk about how valuable that's been, you know, for you? It's been extremely valuable. One of the, of the best parts about my job is I've stood next to a, some mentors through the years who've helped guide my way. And going back to what you were saying, it's really easy to get away with doing something that you deem to work when it's just you around and no one's looking. But when you have 18 other sets of eyes on it, chances are someone's going to speak up. And we've also facilitated an environment where we meet on a regular basis and discuss the evidence, discuss what we're doing. And one of the biggest problems with evidence-based medicine is the operational assumption that we've already arrived at the answer. And if you look at it from that frame, people are like, well, I know I can do this and I know it works, but evidence is always evolving. Treatment's always evolving. I'm sure 50 years from now, we'll look back on some things we're doing and have a laugh over it. But in the same token, it's got to be something that has to be part of a process, not a destination. I, I don't think there will ever be, you know, there will always be mounting evidence. And at some point, yes, it's pretty hard to argue against something working. But if you look at the current evidence on how effective we are in the musculoskeletal realm, we haven't arrived anywhere and we should have a certain air of uncertainty in what we're doing. And it should drive us to go seek out to be better instead of thinking that we have the answer for what it is right now. And, and a big component of evidence-based medicine that I would concede or really advocate for is the whole checking your ego at the door because none of us really have a good grasp on it. And it's only by working together and fighting amongst ourselves with the current data sets we have that we can figure it out. Or we can go make an Instagram post that says, we have the ultimate cure for everything. As long as it's on opioid, come see us instead. So, right. yeah, I, uh, I agree. I, I liked, you know, one, one more piece about the Sackett article. And I think we can just summarize that guy, uh, is I liked when he made the point or they made the point of evidence-based medicine is, is not restricted to randomized controlled trials or meta-analysis. And it, it's, it's something that we've talked about, before on the clinical athlete forum is quality of evidence does not necessarily equate to the level of the evidence. So you can have a really shitty level one study. It can be, you know, you, it can be a randomized controlled trial. It can be, it can be double blind, you know, uh, metal anal meta analysis with only r shitty randomized controlled trials. It's still it's shit in shit out. Um, and so level of edit evidence does not automatically equate to high quality of evidence. And it, it just depends on the clinical question involved. And so I think that 
you know, it's an example of some of the studies on uh, different manual therapy modalities that are, you know, A versus A plus B, where you have A is, is typically like exercise and B is the modality in question. And then sure enough, A plus B group has a, a significant inc or decrease in pain or a significant increase in short-term function or something like that. And then it's equated to B. It's equated to the treatment, the, the extra treatment. Oh, it must have been that because both groups got exercise. But in, in reality, what we're not, we're not uh, you know, controlling for is the nonspecific effects of the patient just getting more. You know, they just, they just got more treatment. They got more time with the clinician. They got that, that feel of the, of the hands-on, which is usually, you know, can equate to somebody just feeling like they're getting more attention. Uh, and, but that's a randomized controlled trial. You know, it's level one evidence, but the quality of which uh, can be called in, into question. There are some great observational studies that are really low on the, on the level of evidence, but, you know, have given us some great information like, you know, smoking has been linked to cancer. That wasn't, that's not, there's no randomized controlled trial showing that, you know, it was, it was large sample sizes and it was, uh, it's epidemiology. And it, and so I, I just think that was a, an important point. I think something that's missed uh, a lot in what we do. When, I think that was fleshed out well in Joel Bialowski's paper that just came out this month in JOSPT, where they tried to discuss the, the theatrics of the yeah. additional treatment or the ritual that goes into it. And it's not so much any effect that the treatment directly has, but the show that the patient sees going into it that conveys additional expertise. And SIBO uh, over the next five years will probably evolve into having multiple different subsets of definitions because placebo in and of itself implies inert, but we obviously discuss the placebo effect on a regular basis. Well, if it has an effect that's already contradictory to its definition, and that's why you're starting to see that definition change. And there are, you know, you have to look at natural history as a result. You have to look at patient expectations as a result. And all those things are slowly getting fleshed out in the literature. And just like everything, it's, it's much more complicated complex than we like to make it out to be. And as much as it's important for us to be able to explain at a relatively simple level to a patient what's going on, we need to have the understanding that it is way more complex and way more multivariate than we like to give it credit for. Well, and I think too, whenever uh, we talk placebo, you know, if, 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 we're, if we're saying, you know, we're not saying we shouldn't maximize placebo, because uh, there's placebo with everything. There's non there's non specific effects with exercise. You know, there's non specific effects with our the way that we educate. Um, and, but we can maximize that effect that way. We don't need to use uh, necessarily modalities that have not been shown to do anything other than that. And I and I think that's you know. Well, the crazy part is the way we know how to maximize placebo is from the evidence. So we still go back to it being this foundation of scientific evidence that starts showing us the placebo is multivariate, showing us ways that we can start changing what we're doing in order to hedge that placebo bet. It's not that we pick that up from experience, and there are some subsets that you do get from that, whether it be the position that you have with a patient or the means with which you discuss, but we know that those effects are very quantifiable thanks to the evidence. And it's able to go back and justify what you're doing and then take that little piece and add it to the other little piece of the evidence and, and slowly make that slightly less small piece realizing that we're probably never going to figure everything out down to the end of it mike you got any final thoughts on on sacket um i mean i think you guys covered it pretty well i would just add i think the whole point of this obviously the founding keystone to evidence-based medicine is the fact that it's founded on scientific principles and like we said the scientific method so the whole point of science is to gain a better understanding of the world around us and every time we look at new evidence presented or we change our stance with um, um, more evidence being published it's just to gain a better perspective of what we think is happening or what we think is going on and so that's the entire point of it is just continuously stay up to date on this evidence and that we understand more and more happening in front of us. Yeah, I think you guys have said before, science is, you know, we're, we're in the business of being less wrong. Uh, it, we're, yeah. you know, it's constant truth seeking, but 
but again, the the process is is what is what we're into here, and and again, and being less wrong, uh, filtering out hypotheses, you know, alternative hypotheses. Well, at least we know it's not that. You know, we don't know, we still don't know what it is, but we can rule that out. So that's a start. You know, and and it, it just goes back to a lot of these a lot of these treatment modalities that I'm sure that we'll discuss it in, in detail. That we haven't, we still have no idea. Um, how to explain at all? You know, we haven't we haven't ruled out any of the alternative hypotheses, but yet the narratives are built around spe- a specific yeah. one or two. You know, and it's 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 frustrating because we can't we also can't disprove that yet. Right. And there's a lot of illogical jumps that happen in, in narratives, especially like clinicians on a daily basis. And uh, what you'll usually see is just a bit of hyperbole. Like they'll take a small thing that we understand through scientific evidence and then it just gets magnified. And a lot of illogical jumps are made to explain, well, well this is why you need treatment to help you with pain or dysfunction. Um, and I think it's just realizing like we, we have to be willing to admit we don't have everything. We don't even have a very small percentage of things figured out just yet. So, um, and I think... Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, just to give a brief quote, I think there was a good quote um, I heard the other day on You Are Not So Smart podcast by Brian Nosak, who's a psychologist. Um, and he said, you know, science is wrong about everything, but you can trust it more than anything. And that summarizes EBM to me at best is, you know, we really don't understand a whole lot. But the little bit that we do understand, uh, we need to kind of stick to that and not try to, to fill in the gaps with just um, Mad Lib. And so Sackett, you know, way back in 96 was just trying to give us some, but somewhat of a framework, uh, you know, a pr- get the, get the best available evidence, external evidence, um, and then integrate your clinical expertise and while acknowledging and, uh, you know, I guess I don't want to say accepting but you know, acknowledging, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. The the a patient patient's preferences, while you're implementing the scientific scientific principles, you know, the the to, yeah. to the best of your abilities. And and it's a it, back then, you know, that was as that was as much as we had. Um, I think. Do you guys summarize Sackett's article in any other way before we move on here? Um, one thing I wanted to add, I think. Uh, patient preferences can be flushed out a little bit more. I don't really think that that means a patient walking in and saying, I want ISTM or I want taping. I really don't think that what that means. I think what it actually means is what are the co- cultural and social norms and personal experiences of that patient to surround their idea of what treatment is like or what you know their perception of what their issue is that they're dealing with. But I, I don't think that means the patient comes in and demands treatment on the spot and you take that into consideration. It's more of what all encompasses this person being who they are and where you're meeting them at. I, I, you even look at things like where the athlete is in season. So that, that changes yeah. some of your patient's values or, you know, what the person has going on at home. If I have a patient driving an hour to see me versus 15 minutes, that tends to change a little bit about my education, what needs to go down because I understand I'm not going to have the convenience of being able to see this patient more. If I have with a hamstring strain who's trying to get a D1 scholarship three weeks from now, that's going to change the value that I approach with our training. It still goes down to probability, but, you know, we may be a little bit more, um, well, it's, it's always about informing the patient, but informing that patient that in this instance, there may be, even though the probability is the same, your risk is ultimately your discretion. Well, would yeah. you guys agree to, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with everything you said, you know, Mike, especially with, with your definition. But would you guys say that patient preferences is many times the way I'm seeing it interpreted on the Internet uh, through discussions is the patient's expectations toward treatment? So number one, would you say that that's bis- being misinterpreted commonly? And number two, would you still say that you know, if the if the patient's coming in your door expecting a certain treatment because of what they got in the past, and based on the evidence that you're aware of, uh, you will likely go a different route, whether they want that or not. It's patient preference still comes down to their expectations toward the treatment themselves. Yeah, yeah, I think it's laying out like Derek was saying with probabilities. Like, here's our options. 
treatment. Here's what the evidence says about these options for treatment. And this is the most likely choice in order to get you to whatever your end goal may or may not be. And so that's kind of what our job is with guiding the process, so to speak. And I know Derek and I've talked a lot about that in the past is uh, as a clinician, we're just there to guide the process. So it's figuring out what's the best choice for you. Um, but I mean, absolutely, as far as especially being a chiropractor and a chiropractor who went to, uh, we, and we could be a whole other podcast in of itself, but like a straight chiropractic school that only taught mostly joint manipulations. Um, I constantly am faced with patients who come in because I'm a chiropractor thinking that because I had low back pain or neck pain or whatever that I need to do joint manipulations. And what I found is completely anecdotal, but if I educate based on probability of getting them from where they're at to where they want to be and what the evidence currently says, uh, rarely do I run into someone that's like, no, this is exactly what I, I have to have this almost like a drug addict, but that just doesn't seem to happen. Yeah. Mike, I think you, I think because of what you just said, you probably run into this more. I think Derek, you know, being in more of, uh, with the university, I think you, I'm putting words in your mouth and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're not in private practice and I feel like that you'll have more confidence just laying the groundwork. It's like, no, this is what we're going to do and this is the why. In private practice, I know I feel pressure because the people coming in the door is also what's keeping the lights on. And and so, you know, spinning spinning the narrative to, to uh, be based on scientific evidence but not in a way that pisses off the patient, <laughs> you know, is, is I think a skill in and of itself. And Mike, I think with you, just the – you said it, just the, just the thought of chiropractor pigeonholes you or puts you in this box as doing a certain modality. You are, you are your treatment. Right. Right. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so, and I'm sure that's, that's something you run into. Do you literally list, cause I know you're saying I, I, I discussed the probabilities. Do you, do you list out options like, all right, this is what we can do. X graded exposure, exercise, um, this manual therapy, this modality, and like down the line, and then explain why you are or are not going to do it, what the research yeah, says with each one like that? For sure. I mean, I easily have a patient regularly. Um, someone is like, well, why aren't you doing joint manipulations? Or what, what does the evidence say about this? Or why aren't you doing ISTM or K-tape? And so it's just going through those options. I, those pretty much just get all lumped into manual therapy, so it's a lot easier to discuss those. But yeah, you know, the evidence isn't great. It's not stellar for long-term outcomes for those modalities. And so if it's a case, like let's say um, the patient's thinking surgery, then we'll look at what are the outcomes for the surgery? What are we seeing for long-term outcomes with patients based on the issue you're dealing with? What does it look like with doing what we call conservative management with graded exercise exposure and modified activity? And um, take into account, in, in my mind, their preconceptions about the issue or their preference being, I need to return to sport in X number of days because I'm going into on season, you know, like Derek was mentioning. So trying to figure out what is the best treatment option in order to get you to your goal. And so that's totally dependent on what they're willing to go through. You know, if surgery is not on the table, then that's obviously not going to be something the clinician should be saying, like, you absolutely have to have surgery for this because it is patient directed treatment at the end of the day. Yeah. Derek, how do you deal with that? You know, a patient comes in and they're expecting a certain treatment or a certain modality that they've had in the past, whether they, whether they want it or not, they just, that's what they expect from you. How do you kind of, and it's not what you deem is best for them based on current evidence. How do you kind of spin that? Well, I think one thing that needs kind of backed up on is we have to remember, especially in the PT world, um, chiros have been doctoral level for a while, but if we want to really embody that doctoral title that we fought for and their side discussions on whether we should be called that doctor means to teach so our ultimate thing is to educate the patient and the better informed we are on the evidence the easier that cell tends to be so i don't mind sitting there and discussing with the patient what the evidence says and most of the time if you can articulately explain there's not much evidence for it they buy into it. Now, there are going to be those instances where, you know, a patient comes in with an expectation. They said, this is ultimately what I want. But that's on me as a clinician as well to have the right to say, well, there is no evidence for that. And I cannot justify this. There are plenty of second opinions you can get. I'm sure if a patient went to a surgeon and said, I want to have X surgery, the surgeon, if they didn't think it was warranted, will be well within their rights to say, 
no, you're not a candidate for this right now. And that's not frowned upon. They can go get a second opinion, but we tend to frown upon the people who ultimately just want justification for what they want from yeah, both yeah. sides of it. I, I uh, think, too, to like uh, piggyback off of that, and, and Quinn mentioned this earlier with keeping the lights on. I mean, I think as a private practice clinician, that is the ethical conundrum of it, right, is upcharges and offering, you know, K-tape and ISCM and joint manipulations and laser and ultrasound, like every single time, especially if you're insurance space, those are upcharges. Um, and, and you can get into the ethical debate of whether the patient actually needs any of that, but then the argument is what well, makes them feel better, quote unquote. So therefore, that's why I justify it. Um, and then at the end of the day, that's an increased paycheck because of that. Yeah, I like I like the idea of literally kind of listing it out for the for the patient in a in a hierarchy. Um, I mean, I'm, and I'm picturing like making an actual physical list and, and doing so after the evaluation, cause, you know, cause I think that there is a time during, during the session where they're maybe more receptible or receptive, receptible, uh, receptive to questioning or spinning their expectation. I don't necessarily think the best time to do it is right in the door where the, you know, the first five minutes you're talking and, and they, 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 to tell you or they're they're clearly stating that they're expecting a certain modality that you're probably not going to be giving them and in that first five minutes you say okay hold on we're probably not going to do that because that's bullshit and then you go on this rant you know you haven't built that rapport yet you haven't gotten that yeah. they haven't gotten to like you yet but yeah, you can't go zero to 60 right uh, out of the yeah game, you just listen sure. to them you say okay <laughs> you know you, you listen you listen you listen you go through eval you start talking them through what you're seeing what you're not seeing and these things and then you and then you make a little list and you start you know explaining what you feel is going to be best in the long term and then you go down the hierarchy and then explain to them that the treatment that they mentioned in the very beginning, the reason that it's below, you know, why it's low on the list here is because of, of X, Y, and Z. But, you know, I really like that. I think that's the explaining that the, the probability is not just in your head as the clinician but actually uh, expressing that to the patient I think is, is pretty yeah. cool. Um, let's move. Yeah, because otherwise you No, go. I was just saying, otherwise, if we're not using the evidence to list out that hierarchy, then we're, we're no better than someone, anyone else offering up some modality with some fancy narrative, you know, it should be guiding our path. Sure, because exercise can be the same, you know, we can say, oh, you're, you're in pain because you're weak, you know, and that's just... Oh, that's yeah, just, and that, that's a whole other... Sure, but it's yeah. as, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, as sometimes invalid a, a narrative as anything else, so, uh, you know, I like that a lot. The... The second article, kind of moving on, is a response to Sackett um, yeah, by Ianitis, John Ianitis or Ionitis, correct me there, one, one of the two. Evidence-based medicine Ionitis. has been hijacked. Which one is it, Derek? Ionitis. Ionitis, all right. A report so. to David Sackett. And this is also a short commentary, but it's kind of, de honestly, it's kind of depressing. Um, this, So Ionitis was obviously... Uh, respected uh, Sackett very much um, and, and, you know, pays homage to him many times in the article and is, is kind of a narrative almost speaking to, to David Sackett um, and about the state of things today. And Ionitis seems, his point seems to be that um, the quality of, of research right now is, is extremely biased um, and the the capitalism has kind of surpassed the desire for truth. Is that how you guys interpreted this this paper as well? Well, this is the guy who wrote a paper called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Correct. And he's pretty much made it his mission to expose a lot of the fallacies that are used in truth seeking if we're going to go after that and i to go back to what you were saying a moment ago it seems like it's this dichotomy that emerges between marketing and trying to do what's best and especially if we're going to be true clinicians it, it should ultimately be about the patient yeah we got to keep the lights on we have to do that but it's realizing that this is a slow process for this change and I think Ionitis is frustrated with the fact that 
we had these established parameters with which to grade some evidence. And as soon as we established them, people are like, oh, a systematic review is great. Let's start bastardizing systematic reviews or we need peer reviewed literature. Let's all just get amongst our peers and create our journal and review the literature. And then we can put it behind a paywall that nobody can get access to. And everybody can just look at the abstract and glean our little bit of narrative that barely skipped the rock across the water on our crappy methods. And then we'll turn that into fact, or at least we'll turn it into a product that we can sell. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's very um, doom and gloom in this commentary. It's, it's basically like, here are our failures over the past 25 years. And here's what Sackett intended for UBM to be. And here's how we missed that target. Um, but I think, uh, honestly, I think, he has valid concerns, just like Derek was giving examples of. Those are absolutely things that happen, and it's unfortunate. And we need to be aware of those situations and how to um, look at things like predatory publishing and to be aware of it. But I think it may be a little overinflated. Um, I don't think it's as bad as he kind of gives it, but also I don't have 25 years of frustration built up in, in his shoes, so to speak. Yeah, I think, I mean, when you read it, it's almost like, well, I guess, I guess we'll just give up on, on research. You know, yeah. it's almost like, oh, phew, I don't have to read any more research because it's all biased and, and um, you know, convoluted and, and just seeking seeking money. So uh, that's a weight off my shoulders. But I think it, I, I think these are real. You know, these, these problems are real. And it goes back to one, one thing that he says is, um, you know, the industry runs on a large share of, of in, influential randomized trials. They do them well. So the methodology is sound. Um, and they score decently well on these quality checklists, but they're asking the wrong questions or the, the questions are interpreted or, or the, the effect sizes are, are such that it's like, Meh, you know, or the, or the significance of the findings is like, eh, when you really look at the stats, but then the conclusions are inflated. And, and what do we do as, uh, you know, as societies, we, we jump right down into the conclusion of the abstract and then it's just we take it and run with it. So it, it kind of goes back to, again, level of evidence doesn't doesn't denote quality. And then to me, it goes to what we're going to talk about probably a little later, which is looking at the totality of the evidence. But it's so difficult because there's so much. How do you guys some, I guess you know, applicable things? How do you guys stay on top? of the research as far as sifting through, because you only have so many, much time in the day. Uh, are you looking at, are you looking at a systematic review before you're looking at anything else? Are you looking at specific journals? Uh, are you getting emails from these journals? Like how do you, how do you guys do that? I think some of it, it it's a process that you develop over time. Um, if it's a topic I'm not as familiar with, I uh, will certainly start in a systematic review of ones available. But you start looking at systematic reviews and you see little things like if there's one outlier study, then that's the study I'm the most likely to go pull because I want to see what set it apart from the rest. Or, you know, we we were taught to value the P value so much that we started overvaluing it. And it's realizing that this distillation down to the simplistic terms of bad evidence is wrong. It's not a dichotomy it's a spectrum and yes a lot of it falls much more towards the bad side of the spectrum but there will be components to some crappy papers that actually have some merit in them and there are some components to some very well conducted papers that are absolute bullshit and like you said i think some of it is not getting hung up on the conclusions and learning how to actually process the data for yourself um, I have, and actually to give you props with clinical athlete, as a result of the network I've made there, there's a lot of clinicians that have different interests or interests and all of us with our interests, if there's something's worthy of being read, it normally gets passed around as, Hey, this isn't a topic that you're that, that's that high on your radar, but this one's worth reading just to keep you up with what's going on. And then evidence-based medicine does sort of turn into a game of gotcha and it's almost fun to find papers and shred them if they there's ones that latch on to social media that say this is the great next new thing and it 
you're like, oh, actually, it's kind of bullshit. But that could just be my weird definition of fun, too. So, <laughs> No, I definitely think that's fun. It's like, it's like a Friday night at home, right? Yeah. Well, well it's, it's like an inside joke because you start learning, hey, a lot of what we're seeing out on especially social media is shit. And it's this yeah. whole we're going to rush to the end instead of – walking through the evidence and processing what's going on we just look at the conclusion and you know i think it's called jumping to conclusions for a reason and it has a negative connotation for that phrase instead we should probably look at the method you know it, it's impressive to watch someone squat 900 pounds but if you want to figure out how they did it you probably need to look at their method it, looking at them squat 900 pounds doesn't tell you anything except for the fact that they did it looking at their training log then you see how they got there yeah, social media is almost like a, it's just a cherry picking um, masquerade of scientific research, so to speak. It's like, oh, I found a study that confirms my biases for joint manipulations or like the AMA one that was uh, recently put out. Or, you know, I found a study that supports ISTM decreasing pain. And it's like, all right, like how good is that study actually conducted? What do the methods look like? And um, I think that that's probably where we need to just get better as clinicians reading research and, and looking at method sections first. Yeah, I also think it's the human element of this whole thing because I can tell you right now, I do the same thing, only it's just not my bias happens to be exercise. You know, yeah. and so if I see I see a study that's like, oh, strengthening decreased your pain. There it is. Boom. Yeah. You know, and it's it's like yeah. that's just as bad. It, it's at least I always I always um justify it by saying at least we know that exercise has a physiological effect. Like it does things to your cells and stuff. Like it changes your biology. Uh, but that, but that, but that's my, you know, that's how I justify it. As at least, yeah. you know, I don't know why uh, getting, getting stronger, uh, decrease your pain, which doesn't make any sense. Like why would just producing more force, uh, somehow change your perception, but it sometimes it does, but it just goes the, you know, but it's like, at least, at least you might as well get strong, you know, while I, while mother nature, uh, does her thing and, you know, natural or uh, the, the natural healing process is poor natural selection, you know, is going to pick you off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I mean. <laughs> yeah. And like, Mike, I actually heard you say that we, we were discussing on our, our infamous Facebook thread that maybe we'll, um, put out to the masses one day where you oh, were God. just like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you said something to the effect was like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why, what this does or, or, you know, what the cause of it, but we might as well get strong in the meantime or something like that. And, and yeah, it's usually how I spin things too. I, I thought it was funny in this article to, based on what you guys are talking about with social media, uh, Ioannidis says, often I wonder, this is on page uh, three, often I wonder what monsters have we generated through selection of the fittest. We are cheering people to learn how to absorb money how to get the best PR to inflate their work, how to become more bombastic and least self-critical. These are our science heroes of the 21st century. And isn't that exactly what you guys just said? I mean, isn't that, yeah. the, isn't that social media in a nutshell? You know, we're, we're creating uh, individuals who don't question themselves, and it's really just who, who yells the loudest, it seems. Or has the followers. Especially on social media, it seems that I want a major, that. yeah, a major part of the scientific debate is lost because it's so quick fire. You're expected to respond in a very short amount of time, and there's no way you can really reflect upon a good question in that short amount of time. So all you do is drive straight to narratives, and you know if you we see it all the time where someone will post an articulate response and tag an article to it. And then somebody will respond within three minutes afterwards. And you pretty much know they haven't had time to no read much less process the information presented to them. And once again, I, I think that's where the forum comes in handy because it, you're not expected to respond immediately. And, and science doesn't expect an immediate response. It, it expects you to reflect on it. it. It expects you to process what's going on and what's being said instead of just this was said to me. This is my immediate reaction. This is my system one response to it. It's stepping back and saying, 
well, this person may actually have a point to what they're saying, even though I disagree with him. I need to see what's there before I fire back really fast. And I maybe, think that's a, go ahead. I think that's a good point. Like social media is basically turned into a fist fight, right? And it's about can I beat the shit out of this person in the shortest amount of time publicly to everyone to show how right I am? And science is much more about like, hey, man, you might be wrong about this. You might want to consider this alternative point of view. And that way you can update your stance or your biases so you don't make that mistake down the road again. But on social know, media, it's just a fight. Yeah. And it's you look at some of the shit between like Tesla and Edison. And those, those yeah. dudes would have slugged it out if given the chance. <laughs> For sure. And, and it's yeah. funny because like if you don't – so perception is if you don't respond right away – the other person is going to think that they won. And right. You, you, you can't have that. Right. <laughs> I, you know, you're, you guys are right. Social media is that it's a quick fire deal, especially Instagram, because you can't link anything on Instagram. So you, you can't even expect people to read anything because you can't, you can't cite anything. So it's uh, on the forum, we've, act, you know, I've actually had private conversations because they'll do the same thing on the, on the clinical athlete forum. You guys will, you know, will link several papers and then within the they're coming back with a response. Oh, great information. I, I totally agree. However, boom, boom, boom. You agree with what? You didn't even read anything. There's no possible way. And so, and but we've had uh, private conversations. You know, usually it's students because they, yeah. the student doesn't want to feel like a student. <laughs> you know you've what got, I mean? You've, you've got to get comfortable in being uncomfortable and get yeah. comfortable in being wrong. I, you know, I tell them too on social media. You can come back quick, but just say thank you for the information. I will. I'll read these and formulate a response or thank you for the, you know, I've got some reading to do. You can come back with something quick. Let them know that you're going to read it. If you're, if you're uncomfortable with the silence and you don't, and you don't want them thinking that you're just lost for words, tell them that you're coming. I'm coming for you. You know, give me a day to read all this. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, so I, you know, I I think that's a good point. Is anything else on this uh, Ioannidis article other than just being, just the most depressing deal in the whole world and evidence-based medicine is, is doomed forever. I, I don't see, I don't think he sees it as doomed because in That's some true. other discussions, he's definitely had a more optimistic side, but if you want to elicit change, you have to first say there's a problem. And I think this may have been a little um, ho-hum saying there's a problem, but if you don't address it, then how do you know it's, or how are you ever going to fix it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's just calling attention. He it, he may have done it in a very negative manner. At least that's how I'm perceiving it. But definitely, like, hey, maybe we should be aware of this collectively as a field. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, somebody's got to say it. And then I think that that takes us to uh, the third article of the night: progress, pro- progress, progress in evidence-based medicine a quarter century a quarter century on uh, by Jewel Bigovich. Jovegovic and uh, uh, Benjamin Jovegovic and Gordon Guyet. And essentially, it's, I think, also touching on some of the shortcomings of evidence-based medicine, but um, also explaining how we can kind of systemize and sift through and filter, uh, essentially trying to give clinicians some, some narrative and feedback and commentary on how to improve their appraisal skills, um, and then some of the there's some of the discussion on the the massive influx of papers on a daily basis that come through is just astonishing to me, and we'll probably talk about that. But what were your guys's just kind of initial thoughts about uh, this third paper here? I think uh, the biggest thing I liked about it was how he. T- about the um, three evidence-based medicine epistemological principles and kind of goes through each of those, um, kind of defining what EBM is and uh, their viewpoints. What were those? Yeah, so I can, uh, I'll read those off for you. Uh, The first epistemological principle was the higher the quality of evidence, closer to the truth are our estimates of diagnostic test properties, prognosis, and the effects of health interventions. So just talking about how, and we mentioned this earlier, that all evidence isn't created equally, and therefore the application of it shouldn't be equally applied to clinical practice. Second one was the view that science is cumulative, and scientists should accumulate scientifically. Let that one kind of marinate for a second, Um, (laughs) which reflects um, basically that health claims should be based on systematic reviews that summarize the best uh, available evidence. 
And then the third one was the individual characteristics of a decision maker relates to the third principle. Evidence never determines decisions. It is always evidence in the context of values and preferences. How do you guys interpret that stuff? Is that are those do you feel, you know, more useful guidelines than just kind of this misinterpreted three pronged approach? Or is this something completely separate? I tend to adhere to the Carl Sagan quote of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the more outlandish or the more broad a claim is, the more there needs to be an insurmountable amount of evidence to support the claim. Um, and the best part about that, apparently, that's was made popular by Carl Sagan, but was even him. So that goes back to, you know, the more we look at what we think we know, the more it might be wrong. But if we never take the time to look and see if we're wrong, how will we ever know? And evidence-based medicine is really a constant desire to prove ourselves wrong because uh, we can always find things we agree with. That's that's very easy to do, especially it, with the, the amount of evidence being published these days. But seeking out things that disprove what we currently believe, well, that's the only way we're going to change. And if we're really going to evolve as a clinician, that inherently implies change. So shouldn't we be looking for things that could change us out of our current state. Yeah, and I, I think clinical athlete does a great job of that too um, with the forum, especially in private practice. Like you are constantly going to think you're in an echo chamber. You look for things to confirm your own biases instead of challenge them. Whereas with clinical athlete, um, and especially through the people I've met and uh, you, Derek and Quinn, is challenging my belief system, challenging what I think I know. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, it's one, you know, with this paper here, I think that's what they're trying to get at is how do we even know when to challenge, you know, with the quality of, of evidence, with the amount of evidence presented to us, I think it was like 75 uh, randomized controlled trials published every day, 11 systematic reviews every day. It's impossible to stay up on, stay on top of that. Uh, and so... And how do we even know, how do we, you know, even in, increase our appraisal skills? And I'm looking at these uh, diagrams here and this grade uh, system that they're discussing here, which is the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation, essentially looking at quality of evidence and not just the level of the evidence. So they have a diagram here on page three shows the triangle, the levels of evidence that we, a lot of us learned in school as like, you know, expert experience is the bottom, randomized controlled trials is the top, you know, top of the pyramid. It's the best we can get. We equate that with just good, you know, randomized controlled trial. Oh, good. Uh, but then the, the grade system, I've never actually used this, but it, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it, it talks about study design, which a randomized controlled trials is just a design. Uh, and then gives you, you know, kind of feedback here as to as to the quality of the design, you know, regardless of the design. It can be high quality or low quality. You guys used or are familiar with that system before reading this? Uh, not before reading this. Uh, you'll see it mentioned in the methods um, sometimes of um, systematic reviews and how they grade. It's this. Um, there's a lot of ways of weighting, and this just happens to be the one that Guy at um, advocates for. There's probably as many systems of grading decisions and recommendations as there are levels of evidence, if not more, because of course everyone inherently thinks their evidence is best. So yeah, he there's, actually there's cites system that. Best. Yeah. I think he says there's uh, around 206 grading systems currently today. And th this, is, this paper was written, was it last year? Yeah. Or this year? I think it was yeah. last year. Yeah. So there's like this this huge influx of, of papers being published every day, and then there's just as many grading tools. So it's just it's just very difficult. The bottom line is it's it's hard to stay up, uh, it, but it's hard for everyone. You know, we all we're all we're all kind of busy. Uh, we all have stuff going on. I, th I I think that it almost becomes a wash to say that there's there's no time to stay up on it. 
um, it really just becomes practice. And Derek, I've, I've heard you say this before with people who ask you, how do I, how can I get better at reading the literature? And you say, just fucking pick up a paper and read it and then pick up another one and then another one and another one and another one. And then you just get better at sifting through things. You start to realize, you know, what's applicable, um, and what's not. And I, and I think he makes a, there's a point here that's just, you know, the principle of the totality of the evidence. Um, and I think you, you don't get a sense of the totality of the evidence unless you read. You know, you're always going to be a little behind. And that's why we have colleagues. That's why we have networks. That's why we help each other. If we're all in this alone, then yeah, we're fucked. Because there's just way too much to stay on top of by ourselves. But, you know, you got, I, I, I've got more, I've got 400 PDFs on my disk, desktop right now because of you two. Seriously, solely because of you two. Uh, but it, it helps me stay on top of things. And, you know, it's just, it's just about prioritizing. Well, and also that it helps to develop logic or because if you read a paper and especially if it's one that, you know, uh, my bias is heavily against dry needling. So if I'm reading a dry needling paper and I'm going to shred it and call out some method, well, I certainly can't let that method pass on a paper that I agree with. So it starts defining what is okay and what is not. So and you learn a lot more about how to sift through papers by reading topics that you do not agree with as much because that sets the standard for what your bar is going to be. So if I read a method and say, well, these people weren't blinded, and then I read an exercise study where they weren't blinded, I can't automatically give that one a free pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it, it really comes down to the totality of volume out of it. And you start seeing – you see themes. And there are tricks that you can use with which to, you know, make something look a lot shinier. You know, you can take your intervention group and give them something that you know isn't an effective intervention. And all of a sudden, or uh, sorry, your placebo group, give them an ineffective intervention. And all of a sudden, your intervention looks a lot better because you're comparing it to something awful. Yeah. So it, 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 you have to be able to define your rules in the wider net you cast when trying to those rules typically the better it becomes yeah I, I, you've said this before Derek um, it's like it's basically brain reps it's just you know we go to the gym we lift weights we have a goal that we're trying to accomplish with that we go to the gym religiously every single day and it's regimented and it's the same with research it's just consistently reading it over and over and over and over again and eventually you see the patterns that are existing in research and figure out what's meaningful and what's not and how to apply that to practice and can you guys touch on because there's several points I think we can go into, but I, I think that a lot of these points we're going to be talking about in many, many episodes. Uh, if we even make it, you know, if we make it to episode 10, we'll be uh, throwing a party here. But uh, I want to talk about just this notion. One of the big criticisms of evidence-based medicine is that it's too cookbook, meaning that, oh, you're only, you're only going after the evidence, which is a very uh, – pigeonholes you into very – small amount of options as far as interventions and it's very cut or dry there's no individualism associated with that and that's i mean that could be from the truth i mean patient patient values you know we're taking those into account but uh, can you guys talk on this what you know this cookbook approach what that even means as a criticism to evidence-based medicine and um you know how we can mitigate that i think anyone who says that must be a shitty cook <laughs> yeah you, if you're trying to make something, and in this instance, it would most likely be a positive patient outcome, you have to know what your goal is in mind out of it. You know, if I'm trying to make pulled pork, I don't start with a brisket. I need to have some set ingredients with which to do it. And then that in this instance, that would be the evidence with which to justify what I'm doing. And the real skill is to execute the recipe. Yeah. So it, I'm sure you could give me Bobby Flay or Emeril Lagasse's red sauce recipe and I would fuck it up like no other because I don't have the skill that they have. And, and it has nothing to do with the fact I'm following the cookbook. It's entirely on the fact that I don't have the skill with a knife. I, I don't have their method. And it's that's the expertise is developing that method based on the recipe or based on the evidence. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I kind of laugh at this analogy because my wife is a pastry chef and has a, a, a business as a chef. And so 
like you could take any number of her recipes and she could hand it to you. And I almost am complete 100 percent assurance that you would not be able to replicate her end goal of the product and her skill and expertise is in her execution of that recipe and kind of the way i look at evidence is evidence is our ingredients and then it's up to us with our expertise to execute that and to get the outcome that we're trying to accomplish with patient preference situation environment right. all all part of it right yeah all part of the ingredients right right right, right. just just yeah and I, one actually kind of going back to the doom and gloom here, one, part of this paper that was depressing to me was um, it's, it's estimated that investigators or researchers report only 50% of their trials, which, you know, it, it's tough because if, a, if the researchers are under pressure, you know, and the results of which the, of, of their study doesn't necessarily um, jive with the people who are funding the study, sometimes those that data gets that's thrown away. And I mean, if you think about it, if a study shows nothing, that's valuable for us as clinicians. You know, that, that, that tells us maybe a direction to go or not to go, or it tells, it tells other researchers what other questions they should be asking. But I just, you know, I, I don't have a solution for that, surely, but I, I just found that um, just a little disturbing that, that so much data when it doesn't show anything or doesn't show, you know, what, what's favorable, just kind of, kind of tossed. Well, they have a solution for that. And that's the whole pre-registering yes, trials now, absolutely. Yep. which is kind of has an awesome side to it too, because if you occasionally be on PubMed or I will be on PubMed now and you click on something and think it's an article and it's the pre-registered trial. And all of a sudden it's, it's almost like seeing the trailer to a movie. God, I sound like a nerd right now. Uh -huh. You're like, hey, I, they're doing this study on X intervention, and it'll be out in the next year and a half. So I know it's at least in the pipeline that we should get something very well done out of this. Some, yeah. Some, well, you know what you're going to get. I think that's the biggest thing. And, and another uh, – registering the trial mitigates double dipping, triple dipping, quadruple dipping into the data because the way that they're supposed to set that up is that they, they're supposed to lay down methods – in the, like this is what we're doing. This is what we're looking at in the in the registry. So you know exactly what they're going to be doing in the trial. And so when that paper comes out, if all of a sudden they've got another outcome measure or they've got another variable that they measured, uh, you know that they that they're kind of digging there. You know they're they're p hacking to an extent. And that's that's what red what pre registering does is it uh, it gives you a little it gives the the researchers and the outcomes a little bit more credence because. They, they told you what they were going to do, and then they, that's what they did. And the, the, the stats are the stats. You know, the, the outcomes are the outcomes. This is, this is what happened. Um, and, I, and I think that's huge. I think it's extremely important. I think it's going to change the landscape, hopefully. Yeah. I think another thing, I'm pretty sure it was this article. You guys can correct me if I was wrong. Um, but they also discuss how when we're publishing or when research is being published, that the researchers should also discuss what does this mean in the grand scheme of other, say, systematic reviews or other research studies that were done? And how does this either add to that or how does it contradict it? And so what is the, the collective outcome of this research? Yeah, totality of the evidence. Right. Right. But then you just said it, too. Like, how do you f you got to read more? OK, you read you read one review. Well, how does this? compared to this one. Well, you gotta read that one. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like rehab, you know, there's no, there's no quick fix at getting on top of the evidence. You're always going to be playing catch up. That's, which is so funny because what do we hear all the time? The evidence is uh, 10 years behind clinical practice. Yeah, that's hilarious. It takes, yeah, that's a lot of shit. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the evidence is there. Gonna, you just yeah. haven't taken the time to read it. It's, <laughs> that's probably what really should be said. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I think these three I actually liked. I read these in order, uh, just on you know chronological order. But I think that they helped. The you know the first second article just you just throwing it out there. Evidence based medicine is just a thing. Um, you know, Ionidas talking about the the pitfalls. You know, saying that it's it's still nothing's changed as far as what it should be. But here are the pitfalls. Um, and then this this last paper with with Guyatt, just kind of bringing it all together and saying these are the these are the problems that Ionidas was uh, was talking about, but um, let's kind of, this, these are the rebuttals to the problems. This is the claim against it. Here's the solution or the, the uh, you know, the proposed solution. Uh, and this is how we're going to move forward. And, and I thought it was, I thought it was, it was pretty cool to read those in that way.
How do you guys, so this, I mean, this kind of takes us, we're going to end on this, I think, because this was a good discussion and, and uh, you know, we've gained about a hundred listeners already without this, this uh, show even being live, I can feel it. Uh, so we want to, we want to keep on wanting more, you know, going to the, the scientific principles of, of sports rehab, the course, what is, what about this discussion and these articles are you trying to put into that course? Because ultimately, when clinicians go to the scientific principles of rehab, continue education, education course, they're looking for actionable items. But you've got to have a scientific framework. So what's, what's the idea of, of implementing these concepts that we've all discussed and putting it into your course? So a lot of this is really teaching the process or, or ways to either – analyze the literature when we start discussing the evidence-based portion of it or being shown some of your own bias in, in one section i try and discuss survivorship bias as it relates to how we look at low back pain um, it's realizing how multivariate certain components of rehabilitation are and that's really expounded upon when we're discussing the acl and what we think we have control of as variables for rehab versus what's completely out of our control and most of the time we're unaware of Yeah, I think it's just going to try to build a knowledge base uh, about the evidence, how to look at the evidence, giving you that scientific lens, and then figuring out what does this evidence mean and how do I apply it to my clinical practice? How does this help my patient outcomes? Why should I be approaching ACL rehab based on X, Y, and Z? Or why should I approach my low back pain patients based on what the research says? And um, what does that mean? How is that meaningful? Yeah, I think that's going to be the cool. I'm I'm extremely excited about this course. I think I don't think there's anything like it out there uh, where you guys you lay the frame, framework of this is science, uh, this is evidence, this is ha this is the lens at which we can look at things, and then you start taking that to to the common things that we see in clinic, tendinopathies. You know, how can we use exercise and education, two modalities that are evidence based in 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 terms of uh, reshaping expectations and in exercise case actually changing physiology and dose it like medicine almost you know to create in a in a structured plan this is and it's all sci it's all in the evidence when you read it this and this is how we we can make it applicable to you acl rehab you mentioned the low back pain i mean that's i i think that that will be an interesting uh, discussion because I, th I think a lot of a lot of preconceived notions about pain in general are going to be addressed in, in that uh, part of the course and I, I think it's going to be an eye opening for a lot of people. Um, yeah, yeah. We ha we have a whole section on specifically just pain and the pain experience and acute versus chronic pain and what is, what does this mean and why does this matter and um, what should we do with our clinical practice because of this kind of idea of um, the pain experience. But essentially it boils down to a, a good review of the evidence and how that can guide our clinical practice or should guide our clinical practice in some good ways of framing patient rehab. And would you guys say it's, it, all, it always goes back to not teaching people what to think but how to think? Absolutely. And, and, and here, yeah. Yeah, you know, here are some guidelines based on what we think we know, what we think we don't know. Um, this, is not a, this is not a blueprint. You know, it's, it's like uh, you know, a cookbook. I mean, shit can just be guidelines. You get, it's like you said, Mike, like your wife can read a recipe – you can read the same recipe as her, and her shit tastes way better than yours. Uh, and, Absolutely. And so, you know, it's – it's. I, I'm just super excited. The scientific principles of sports rehab and, and just to reiterate some uh, – those upcoming events as we close out here in Worcester, Massachusetts in July 8th, Harrisonburg, Virginia, July 29th, Hillsborough, Oregon, August 19th, uh, Ottawa, Ontario, September 16th, Falls Church, Virginia, Virginia in love. September 23rd, Richmond, Virginia, September 24th, and uh, Harvard Heights, Illinois, September 30th. Uh, and those will be CEU approved for PTs, chiropractors, and athletic trainers. And uh, our two boys here will be leading that course, Derek and Mike. And I'm, I'm just super excited for that. And would like to thank you guys for being a part of the first Clinical Athlete Podcast, Scientific Principles of Sports Rehabilitation. I think... The theme going forward, uh, hell, we don't know yet. We, we'll, 
I, I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine we'll have one, two, three papers to kind of as a jumping off point to discuss a specific topic or two the way that we did today, which was more of just an overarching theme of what is science, what is evidence-based medicine. Uh, and then also having guests on the show to discuss so you don't just hear us ranting um, and hopefully we can disagree on some shit too because it's boring when we all agree. I know there's something we definitely disagree on, like how Clemson's a decent school for sports. Pretty sure Derek and I don't see eye to eye on that. <laughs> yes. Right, you can. If that's the best, if that's the best you got tonight, it's, you <laughs> it is late. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, Mike and Derek, thank you very much. All six listeners, thank you for joining us tonight, and we will see you next time.